Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're going to start in just one minute here. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the training, uh, one of the trainers here at Briggs and Stratton Energy Solutions, and I'm joined by my colleague Daniel Moyer. Good morning, um, everyone. Yeah, and welcome. We're broadcasting to you from California, um, and so it might be afternoon where you are, but uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to wait just for a few seconds as the numbers kind of go up at the beginning of this webinar. Um, today's webinar is a NABSAP accredited uh, training on why the battery management system matters. And we're going to get into the kind of the fundamentals of what, what a battery management system is. And we're really going to cover a lot of topics in batteries. It's an hour and a half long training. I'll try to do my best to, to keep on top of time management. Um, and then we'll have some time for question and answers at the end. So a couple of orders of business. One, um, I can't unmute you and allow you to speak. So if you do have a question, throw it into the Q&A. You should have a Q&A button on your Zoom menu. Um, Daniel might be able to order some, uh, answer some of those questions in, in real time for us. And um, then if you are here for the NABSAP credits, uh, please make sure to wait till the end. Um, the way we issue those NABSAP credits is we check the attendance log and then um, we uh, make sure that your name is there um, on the, that attendance log that you stay till the end and then we send you your certificate via email. So if you're here for the NABSAP credits, you need to send us an email at the end of the talk letting us know how your name is registered with NABSAP so we can get it right on your certificate. So with that being said, I think we're at uh, a steady state in terms of numbers. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on this training. If you are interested in more trainings, we have trainings online at briggsandstratton.com backslash power academy, where you can find uh, self-paced trainings. Um, and we also have uh, more trainings coming up on the training calendar, including some new trainings uh, that talk about things such as uh, how to integrate a generator into an ESS system. And Daniel, do you want to say anything about uh, that training you're about to run soon? Yeah, no, it's been a great, uh, ready to start this training in early July. Um, there's a lot of uh, concepts around uh, integrating generators and in energy storage systems and how they can complement each other rather than compete with each other. We're going to talk not only about how to integrate a generator with our energy storage system, which you see there at the bottom of your screen, but also how do you integrate generators with other uh, manufacturers like Magnum, Schneider, and as well. So looking forward to it. I hope you guys can all join us. I'm looking forward to that training as well, Daniel. Um, so uh, just a couple of things as we get started here. Simplified Power has been around producing energy storage systems for homes and uh, power backup for businesses and off-grid homes as well. Um, since 2010, and uh, to give you an idea of, of what the timeline is for lithium batteries, uh, you know, Tesla came out with the power roll around 2014, 2015. So we've been in this business for a while. We've got a, a long history there. And of course, Briggs & Stratton is a 115-year-old American company um, that's been manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, for a very long time. Many people know them for their power equipment. Um, their engines, their lawnmowers, their go-karts, um, and their generators. Um, and so Briggs & Stratton bought Simplify Power uh, almost two years ago now. Um, and we're able to combine the resources and Simplify is integrated into part of Briggs & Stratton. And as of yesterday, um, we have officially launched as uh, one Briggs & Stratton Energy Solutions uh, provider. It's a uh, division of Briggs & Stratton. So Simplify has been operating on uh, the principle of, of safe, proven, and simple technology ever since our, our beginning. We use a cobalt-free chemistry. I'm not going to talk a lot about chemistry during this talk, but cobalt-free chemistry is the safest battery chemistry. And it's also, uh, at least now, the leading technology in terms of lifetime of the batteries. So you can really get the most out of cobalt-free lithium iron phosphate battery chemistry um, compared to anything else that's on the market. And that's what allows us to offer you one of the best warranties um, that exists. Uh, there's essentially no risk of unmitigated thermal runaway with uh, LFP battery chemistry. And that, that's not true, right, for NMC battery chemistry as we've 
as we've seen from fires and cars, et cetera. And, and because of that, many of those car companies, including uh, Tesla and some of the other big names are switching to LFP chemistry. Uh, 2022 was the first year that more than half of Tesla's manufactured cars uh, had switched to LFP chemistry and more of them are. So we've been doing that ever since our, our founding in 2010. We have external certifications through Underwriters Laboratory. We have 1642 on our cells, 1973 on our battery models modules, and 9540 on system level uh, safety. And so some of your uh, building inspectors are going to be asking for these certifications. Uh, we also do UN, UL 9540 uh, cell module and unit level fire safety testing, and we publish our results. We have UN Department of Transportation certifications for shipping our batteries and even air shipping some of our special order batteries um, that come in an ABS case to meet the weight requirements of air shipments. We're a proven company. We've got, I think this slide's slightly outdated. We have over 300 megawatt hours of these batteries installed at several hundred thousand um, of our lithium batteries out in the field in over 45 countries. We're a US-based manufacturer. We make our batteries. So we do all the assembly and the builds. We do the designs here in Oxnard, California. Um, we're tested and validated by the US Army and Marine Corps. And that means that what we did in the early days, I think 2011, 2012, as we uh, convinced the Army and Marine Corps at the time that, that lithium uh, can be done in a very safe way. And we went through some uh, testing and, and proof of concept um, before uh, being deployed with the U.S. Army and Marine Corps and really demonstrated to them the safety of LFP chemistry. We also have a business model that demonstrates social impact and profitability can coexist. And we do give back with donations to nonprofits. Um, and there's some uh, great projects that we've done in the past. And so if you have a great idea for a project, um, uh, reach out to us, reach out to Daniel and I um, training at simplifypower.com, um, and we might be able to discuss a potential donation. We offer simple technology. One of our goals is to, to be able to integrate our batteries in as easily a fashion as possible uh, with different sources of energy and really with different systems. So we've been an inverter agnostic company with our batteries for years, and we even provide uh, manuals, installation manuals for how to use our batteries and set up the settings with other people's equipment. This technology allows simple energy storage for, for critical backup power for the homeowner, uh, for the business owner, and it, it maximizes resilience and energy security uh, for your customers or even for you if you're here as a homeowner. It can also create savings on utility bills. There is a payback period, right? And if you're cycling your batteries and, and really using them as the energy storage devices that they are, uh, you can pay for your system. Um, and it's, it's really an investment and it's opportunity. Um, so not only is it there for energy security, but you can, you can actually save money on your utility bills. I can say that I'm doing that right now. I have solar on my roof, a five kilowatt array. I've got a Briggs and Stratton inverter in my garage and I've got batteries that store that energy up during the day. Um, and then I can use that in the evenings. There are many different ways to use this, peak shavings, um, uh, time of use, that kind of thing. And we can talk about some of them in the Q&A section. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking here about our timeline, but as I said, we were founded originally in 2010 in Oxnard, California as optimized energy storage. We came out with a Liberty, Liberty Pack, as I mentioned, we, we did testing with the Army and the Marine Corps in 2011 and 12. We relaunched as Simplify Power in 2015 and 16. And just yesterday, we, we launched as Briggs and Stratton Energy Solutions, one complete energy solutions team. So previously you might have known Briggs and Stratton in the energy business as a generator provider. And now we're, we're kind of a full systems level provider. Um, to give you an idea, here are some of our systems. I also want to let you know that um, in addition to having generators and batteries and ESS systems that fully integrate, we also have a whole high voltage project team um, and I'll be mentioning some of our high voltage products throughout this talk, but we can offer containerized solutions, um, basically complete very large scale projects as well. We have a whole team of engineers that work on that. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, we, might be the, we might be the provider for you and our engineers would be happy to uh, get involved, help you design a project. 
So when those large projects come in, keep us in mind. Um, as I mentioned, we've got over 300 megawatt hours installed worldwide. We have distributors in many countries around the world uh, selling our batteries um, and, and offering our warranty. These are some of our products. We're mostly going to be focused in on what's inside the battery. That's the topic of this training today, what's inside the BMS that goes inside all of our batteries. So these are not simple lead acid batteries. These are batteries which have a computer inside each of them. And some of the computers can offer some pretty sophisticated uh, information and feedback, as well as even output controls um, through, through the inverter and through a gateway. Uh, what you see on the right side of the screen is a high voltage battery stack. Uh, what you're seeing in the top left portion of your screen is uh, what we call an access cabinet. That's really essentially an outdoor rated NEMA 3R enclosure. Um, everything's basically pre-wired. We can't ship the batteries in the cabinet for weight and, and regulatory reasons, but basically you pop the batteries in, um, uh, sink down those uh, battery lugs and, and you have a system pre-programmed and ready to go for your needs. Um, so if you're interested in that access cabinet, it's a great solution. It's shown there with Solark. Um, we also offer that with our own inverter. And then in the top center, you can see our uh, battery cabinets as a Boss 12. It also comes in a smaller Boss 6 size um, to offer a cabinet uh, with the bus bars uh, built in and the connections built in. And these cabinets have a uh, fan, a temperature controlled fan to keep the battery cabinet temperature down. And Nathan, we, we, let's go back one slide. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we do have one question already. Um, from Kenny, and, and he's asking about when will we have our high voltage systems ready? And before uh, I let you answer, I'll just point out on the right hand side that that high voltage stack you're seeing there, each one of those modules is 4.3 kilowatt hours each, and they can either be 24 or 48 volts nominal. And as you can see, unlike some of our access cabinets where all the batteries are in parallel, these batteries are all in series, right, to build up to that high voltage. Right. Uh, so um, Nathan, are our high voltage systems ready right now? Yes, they are. So these are custom design systems. You know, we're talking, you know, up to a megawatt hour or maybe two megawatt hours. So very, very large uh, systems. We go up to 1200 volts with these systems. Almost all of these systems are three phase, 480 volts. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but high voltage systems are already um, uh, being developed, right? So we, we, we've installed these systems. We've installed one here in Santa Barbara County near where I live. Um, and so, yes, they're, they are ready to go. So if you have a high voltage project, um, ask our team, right? So we, we roll these out on a kind of a, you know, one by one basis. These are not things that you go to your distributor and say, hey, I would like a, a you know, a container full of, uh, of batteries. You contact our engineers and they make a specific system that, that matches the needs of your, of your client. Um, again, these are custom design systems, but we have a whole team of uh, engineers that work on these. If you're interested, contact me afterwards and I'll put you in touch with the lead of, of that division. I guess we, we're getting in more questions about high voltage. Um, Great. Uh, Nando is asking, what is considered high voltage? That's a good question. I think, uh, uh, Nando, the, the standard for home battery backup is, is 48 volts. Um, and at least in North America, uh, regulations around home battery storage mean that that's rapidly become the standard. It used to be we'd have 12 volt and 24 volt systems in homes. I've been talking with a number of customers that still have 24 volt, um, but 48 volt is really residential and small commercial stuff. Um, so I, I would say that high voltage is really anything beyond that. Uh, and as I said, you know, our high voltage solutions typically are more in the you know, 600 to 1200 volt range. And the reason for this is once you start trying to pull huge amounts of power, like large amounts of power from a battery bank, um, those currents can be significantly high, right? So at a, you know, 100 amps at 50 volts, that's 5,000 watts. If you want to do 50,000 watts, right, you're looking at 1,000 amps. So what if you want to do a million watts, right, a megawatt? Um, then you're looking at very high currents. And because the product of current times voltage gives you power, right? If you increase the voltage, you can decrease the current so that you don't need four inch large um, diameter copper wiring, right? 
Um, so essentially what we do is, is anything beyond about, you know, anything beyond that residential standard of 48 volts is really trying, starting to get into the high voltage region uh, for battery storage and industrial scale stuff is all higher voltage because it does become more cost effective. You need smaller wires to carry that same amount of power. I hope I answered that question. Daniel, did you want to chime in there? No, that's great. And I think you're going to get into this, but the battery management system, which is our topic today, differs a little bit in high voltage. So I'm sure you're going to get into that uh, here in a little bit. Right, exactly. So I do want to talk just for a minute about why you should choose Briggs & Stratton. Um, as I mentioned before, Briggs has been around for 115 years, right? And one of the things we're doing is we're offering a, a, a very solid warranty. And that warranty is coming from a US-based company. Right, your warranty is only as good as as the longevity of the company that provides it, right? And I think a 115 year track record uh, shows that uh, you can uh, have a, a a good feeling about whether or not Briggs is going to be there to back up their products. And we're also considering offering, or, well, we're in the process of even extending our warranty, and some information about that is going to come out. But right now, you can cycle our batteries as many times as you want in 10 years, full depth of discharge full 10 year warranty. We have a very solid warranty on our systems. Um, and we also have been building, a, a, maybe you might, may or may not know the history of, of um, Generac. Uh, Briggs and Stratton was the original uh, partner and provider of the engines that power Generac generators. Um, and in some years ago, Briggs and Stratton and uh, Generac split off. Generac uh, was producing their own engines and Briggs was producing their own generators. And so we have a long history of of backup power uh, generators as well, stand, standby generators. So we've got uh, good technical understanding, long history, both batteries and generators. And now we have systems that fully integrate. And you can see in the top center of your screen there, that app that shows you uh, power coming from uh, different components within an ESS system. And there are reasons you might wanna integrate these. A lot of people seem to be opposed to combining a generator uh, with batteries. Uh, but to be honest, right, a generator is a way for a long-term outage to have a very uh, cheap uh, but very long-lasting uh, power supply, right? A battery bank can only last as long as you size it to be, but for a small extra cost of um, a propane tank, you can really have a lot longer uh, backup power, and that could even be, uh, we, we run these off of propane or, or natural gas, and so these can be easy systems to integrate into your backup uh, power to give you very long-term backup. So what's driving the solar industry? We all know we've got people like me, like Daniel, that work from, work from home. Um, we are more and more uh, having people stay at home and really uh, have that home be their haven um, from, from whatever it is. Right, and we want continuous power, continuous access to the internet to be able to, to communicate with the world and contribute to the world through working. Uh, there's infrastructure challenges, right? We have um, existing problems with our grid and here in California, the grid has been shut down a number of times uh, just in the past year for fire related concerns. Uh, my power went out due to a um, flooding situation that we had in California early in the winter. We don't often get that flooding situation out here. California is not known for lots of rain, but we certainly had quite a quite a winter of it. And across the country, different things uh, can shut down the grid. I, I did my graduate school work uh, at, at the University of Florida, um, and uh, my first year there in the PhD program, they uh, they had two hurricanes come through in the first uh, three months of my time living in Florida, and power was down from each of those hurricanes for about a week lost my whole refrigerator full of food, et cetera. We have lots of reasons, right? Depending on where you are, why the grid might be strained. Um, electrification of everything. I think we're all pretty well aware of, of how the market has gone to electricity and batteries. Uh, out here in California, um, and even I was in Pennsylvania last week uh, doing trainings, I was in Pittsburgh, you're seeing more and more electric vehicles on the road and that's going to create more and more demand on the electric, on the electric grid. Um, so having some backup at your home might help insulate you from some of that or 
if you're like me, you might want to have that charging system in your garage because you might be moving to an electric vehicle. And when you realize it's an equivalent of about 50 cents a gallon to run an electric vehicle um, with, with gas prices the way they are, uh, you might, might be interested in, in switching to electric, not having to change the oil. In my case, not having to skin my knuckles, changing the timing belt on my car. Um, I was just talking to Daniel about being up late at night uh, working on my older Jaguar. Um, Growth of clean energy is also big. We can't ignore the fact that a lot of people want to see green renewable energy. So let me give you one statistic that's on this slide. In the top right corner, you see 15% of solar owners have battery storage. 61% of them actually want battery storage. And we know there's a, a cost um, that, that's prohibiting a lot of these people. There's a, there's a cost challenge. There's a financial challenge to getting there, right? Battery costs are coming down. And we, have, we now have some, some good incentives. So you can add battery to, batteries to an existing system. You can add batteries to a home even without a renewable source of power like solar and still qualify for a 30% uh, check back from the government, a cash uh, incentive program, right, um, with the new IRA. And in different locations, there are, there are different incentives. I was meeting yesterday in Oxnard with a couple of uh, gentleman from New York City. One of them has a, a cabin in Vermont. Vermont's uh, uh, energy provider is offering up to 10,500 off a renewable energy system. So there are pretty good incentives out there, a lot of local ones. Um, and if you're not aware, I would advise you to spend some time on that. You might be able to save your customers, yourself, some money in setting up your first system. You know, Nathan, what I also heard recently is, and, and I've heard this with the introduction of the IRA, that now nonprofits or, or tax exempt entities can now leverage some of these uh, rebates through the IRA. Uh, so it's a great opportunity uh, to talk to, uh, you know, schools, um, houses of worship and other uh, community uh, members that couldn't have otherwise leveraged that. And now with the ability to take a direct cash payment, uh, it's gonna make the financials work for a lot of these projects. So exciting things. Yeah, that, that's great, Daniel. I appreciate you adding that in there. Uh, it's important uh, to, to know what is out there in terms of incentives, right? And um, for whatever reason it is, right? We are incentivizing the move to renewables and we all know those reasons behind that. Let me just point out one thing, uh, one thing about batteries that, that people don't necessarily know. Most people know batteries as, oh, well, you can store the energy and use it later, right? Um, you might think of it as backup power, but batteries are quite different from something like a backup generator. A backup generator is really only there in case you need it. Um, and the big difference here is that the batteries, they can also provide backup power and unlike a generator, they actually give you basically a UPS, an unlimited um, power supply, or sorry, unlimited. They give you an uh, uninterrupted power supply in that with, with battery systems, these backup systems, um, you, you typically have a very fast switch over time and your clocks don't reset, your internet connection doesn't drop, et cetera. But not only that, right? A generator sitting on the side of your house is really only there for the grid to go down. You put batteries on your home, and you can actually start to save money by cycling these batteries. Uh, one thing that you could do is peak shave, right? So I've talked to a number of farmers and other business owners that get uh, these high demand charges and the demand charges depend on uh, what your peak energy uses is, maximum peak energy use is at, at you know, any given time. And so there are these tiers. And so if you go above a certain value of power, right, in kilowatts, um, even if you don't use that much electricity, you get these demand charges. And by having batteries supply some of that power, right, you can reduce the overall power you're drawing from the grid and avoid those peak charges. And these can be significant. I talked to somebody in March who was experiencing seven, $800 demand charges at his business and was going to be installing an ESS system to, to to cut those uh, demands. You need to have a CT on your system to be monitoring that current that's coming in from the grid, but by adding that in, and Daniel, does that work with our ESS? Yes. Yes, we can peak shave, right? So with our ESS system, you can cut down these demand charges by using a CT. Also time of use rates. Uh, so typically people are drawing the heaviest from the grid. 
uh, in the evening time. So morning and evening time are, are typical uh, times when people are using the most energy. When they get up in the morning, they're running that microwave, they're, they're running the stove, electric stove, cook, um, maybe have that heater on that's using the blower motor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then in the evening time, people come home from work, they might turn on that air conditioner, they might uh, you know, turn on the stove, turn on the electricity, or sorry, turn on the electric dryer, all these other things. And electricity companies are, are good at making money, right? And they do that by charging higher rates when the demand is up, and that makes sense. Well, if you have batteries, right, you can avoid some of those peak charges by using your system to provide your energy during those maximum rate times. Um, and so for me, those times are, I think it's 6 to 9 p.m. I get charged all the way up to, I think it's 38 cents or so per kilowatt hour, which is pretty high. Um, the other thing you can do with batteries that you can't do with you know, other backup systems, of course, is to use the battery as a storage mechanism, store the energy during the day when your solar system is generating it. My five kilowatt system on the roof from about 10 a.m. until typically around 3 p.m., my system is outputting more like four kilowatts continuously. So if I'm outputting four kilowatts over the course of you know, five, six hours during the day, you know, I'm getting 25, 30 kilowatt hours out of my system saved every day. I can use that energy in the nighttime and avoid having to uh, pull that off of the grid and hit those peak charges. There's different ways to save energy. So I'm going to talk very briefly, um, and, and I say very briefly here, about the effects of the seasons, et cetera, on solar energy that's coming in. And I'm really gonna go through a lot of things in this talk. I'm gonna just briefly hit on this. What I'm showing on the left side of the screen is, is a cartoon of the earth going around the sun. The earth is going around the sun in an orbit, but the orbit, uh, the earth is also spinning on an axis and that axis is tilted towards or away from the sun depending on what time of year it is. So uh, number four there in the picture, you still see the earth tilted toward the sun the northern hemisphere of the earth is tilted towards the sun. That represents summer. That's right now. In fact, uh, my daughter's birthday is on the summer solstice. We just had the longest day of the year and the days are gonna start to get shorter. Well, uh, our energy systems produce more energy during the summer months, right? Of course, the spinning of the earth, it spins you know, 365 times as it goes through one orbit. The spinning of the earth is what causes your day and nighttime. Um, so if you're spinning in the summer, uh, you're, you're spending more time in illuminated and less time in the shadow. Over here on number two, this is a winter. So for the Northern hemisphere, you're tilted away from the sun. And so as you spin around in a circle like this, um, you're spending more time uh, in, in the shadow of the rest of the earth. And, and what that results in is uh, variations in how much solar is being produced. So I have a South facing array. I've done South facing arrays on other buildings. I'll show you one in a minute. But typically we're looking about 40% of the number of kilowatt hours, the energy produced from a solar system in the winter time here in California compared to the summertime. And so the ways you can get around that, but you have to keep that in mind and you have to make your customers aware that they might meet all their energy demands with their solar system or their battery backup system in the summer um, and then struggle in the winter. And I was talking to a customer two days ago uh, who's going through exactly that. Um, who's trying to beef up his charging uh, of his batteries um, by adding another inverter um, so that he can run his generator for a shorter amount of time. He's also talked about en en enhancing his solar array to add some more panels. So what happens with the sunlight? So with the sunlight, um, the sunlight comes through the atmosphere of the earth. You get about 40% of it reflected or absorbed by the atmosphere. And you get about a thousand watts, depending on your latitude, coming in per square meter. It's a little higher, closer to the equator, and it certainly depends on weather, et cetera. But any given time, AM 1.5 means the air going through one and a half thicknesses of atmosphere. You're looking at about a thousand watts striking a panel if that panel is directly facing the sun, right? So when that sun, when your panel's pointed directly towards the sun. So what I'm showing you here is a south facing array on a, on, on a, a building really close to my home. Um, that's a, I think a 7.5 kilowatt array. Got 2,425 watt panels there. And what you see, I'm showing you different uh, months of the year, that's a January through December, is you see that energy being produced, right? That's the total amount of energy 
Um, the energy being produced in the in the summer months goes way up, and then in the winter months it comes down. So we go from somewhere around 15 to 20 kilowatt hours in the worst months. Um, uh, those are days. Those are weeks um, that are being shown there, um, and then all the way up to maybe 50 kilowatt hours um, uh, in in the summer months. So there's a big difference, 20 to 50, right? It's about 40 percent. Um, the next thing you can see is over the course of a day in the bottom of the screen, you see that that power uh, starts ramping up around 9 a.m. This is a grid tied system, by the way, it doesn't have batteries, it's just feeding back to grid. And then it cuts off around uh, 7 p.m. And that's that's in a, on a March day. So that's a that's a spring springtime day. So it's fairly typical. That's a 7.5 kilowatt array, but we're less than six kilowatts max production there. So just keep that in mind. You're not going to get the nameplate reading off of your solar array. That's based on a 25 degrees Celsius temperature. And that's uh, based on a panel directly facing the sun uh, with no clouds overhead, uh, no humidity in the air. So that's what that AM 1.500 watt panel is rated at 100 watts when it meets all those conditions. Typical panels get hotter. As they get hotter, they produce a little bit less electricity. Okay, so I wanna differentiate two things as I go into this talk about the BMS. One, I wanna differentiate the power versus energy. Power is how quickly you're using energy and energy is how much you are, you are using, right? So I want you to think of batteries as a container, a container that holds energy. Power is the rate at which I'm pumping water, the number of gallons per minute or liters per second or whatever number you want to use. In terms of electricity, we specify power in kilowatts, the number of thousand joules per second that we pump through. So what I'm showing you on the right side of the screen is a system. This is a uh, system that, that I installed with students. This is a water tower that we built. And these solar panels on the top of the water tower <coughs> actually power a sun pump water pump. So it's a solar powered water pump. That pump is a thousand feet away in a lake. And those panels absorb sunlight. They push the water into that storage tank. That tank on the top is a, I think it's a 10,000 liter tank, a very big tank. Um, and that water is then there for later use. It runs down through some filters and becomes clean drinking water in the bottom, but that's not really relevant for my analogy. Again, um, the, the pump in the case of solar uh, would be your inverter, right? Or your charge controller. And so that's pumping that energy into your battery system and that battery is saving that energy for later use. So that's how I want you to think of batteries. Let's talk just a second about the inside. Daniel, is, have there been any questions that I should be answering? We, we do have one. Um, Scott's asking, you mentioned your ESS inverter uh, and commented on some of its capabilities. When is the upcoming Simplify Learning Session for that ESS inverter? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I think we have one coming out in three weeks, but I'm not uh, I'm not certain on the date. I'm going to have to get back to you, but that will go up on our calendar shortly. Um, so we're revising some of that. Uh, earlier this week, I was meeting with some installers and just doing uh, single line diagrams and uh, system design. And so our, our next ESS training session is actually going to include a number of examples of system designs, how exactly you might incorporate or even remove a transfer switch, how you would bring it through the main panel, panel where you would put breakers, et cetera. So it's going to be a training that's more focused on the capabilities of that system, um, but one that helps uh, installers with system design. That being said, if you wanna check our YouTube channel, um, go to YouTube, check Simplify Power, right? Search for Simplify Power, and you can see past trainings that we've done on that ESS system. Um, additionally, the new training on the ESS is going to feature more um, feedback and uh, uh, training regarding energy track and the usage of the software and using that software to set it up. Um, and so that's upcoming. And I'm sorry, don't have the date off the top of my mind. I'd have to look at the calendar. So thanks for the question. Uh, it's coming up quite soon, um, and we're, we are shipping units quite soon. So lithium ion uh, chemistry and form factor. So there are different types of lithium ion batteries, many different types of lithium ion batteries. The typical battery that you will see in power tools is a NMC or LCO batteries. Uh, these are batteries um, that need to be light, 
right? If you're operating a drone, you want the lightest possible battery because you don't want to carry a heavy payload. Um, typically, these have been used in cars, although, as I said, um, uh, manufacturers are changing. Rivion and, uh, and Tesla are leading the way in kind of moving to LFP-based chemistry. And I think Ford just came out and said that all of their uh, future electric vehicles will be produced with lithium ion or lithium iron phosphate. That's LFP, F for ferro, which means iron in Latin. So Daniel, I saw another uh, question come in. Um, go ahead and interrupt if it's one we should be answering. Um, the there are many kinds of chemistry, um, and they differ in the cathode side of the battery. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but basically, what you should know is LFP is really the only type of chemistry at this time that I would recommend for using in the home. And the reason is it's the longest lasting battery chemistry that's out there. You'll get the most number of cycles. It'll give you the most number of years um, and it's the safest. And when you're putting something in your house where you're gonna be sleeping at nighttime, you don't wanna worry whether your system is going to cause safety concerns for your family. LFP batteries have a long history of proven safety, and they're the one battery that does not go into unmitigated thermal runaway. We've been dealing and using um, this technology ever since our inception in 2010. We've probably the, the longest uh, uh, lived US-based manufacturer of, of LFP batteries. Form factor also matters though. Not all batteries are constructed the same. The way the batteries are constructed is typically in three different types. Um, and there's kind of a fourth type that's been coming out with these blade batteries. Uh, and we can talk about that once that technology really hits the market. But right now the three main batteries types that are on the market are cylindrical cells. You can think of a, a steel cased cell, um, just like a AAA battery or a AA battery. Um, then pouch cells are basically an aluminum foil encased uh, cell, the cheapest type of cell to manufacture, um, but it also is the shortest live and least safe cell to manufacture. Then there are prismatic cells and prismatic cells are typically large plastic encased cells. They're in a rigid plastic case, but you do get some flex. And so <clears throat> with prismatic cells through continued heating, um, heating and cooling cycles, which happen naturally when batteries uh, charge and discharge, you get more swelling and contraction with prismatic cells just based on the design. Um, and that results in sh slightly shorter lifetimes. So it's a little bit cheaper to manufacture these prismatic cells. They also come in a very large format, but they don't typically last as long as cylindrical cells. Um, the best cell to use is cylindrical cells. It's what we use. It's best cell in terms of um, performance and longevity. The downside to it, of course, is it comes at a slightly higher cost point. So we don't come into the market trying to produce the cheapest battery that's there. We tr come into the market trying to produce the highest quality, longest lived and safest battery on the market. We use cylindrical cells in all of our battery builds um, and we offer uh, the best warranty in the market backed by a, a long lasting American company. What you see there is I'm showing you actually on the screen, I'm holding an Apple uh, iPhone battery cell that I had taken out of a phone that had bulged out. I don't wanna point uh, just to Apple on this. I also removed one from an Android device just a week ago uh, for my wife that had bubbled out. Um, and so these, these pouch cells don't last nearly as long. They're not as reliable. Nathan, do you see, uh, somebody's asking, do you see the price of batteries going down uh, in the industry uh, in general? Um, yes, we do. Um, so it's a good do, question, do right? A, because a rate. <laughs> yeah, I don't. we don't have a rate. I can tell you that our batteries have been coming down in cost. And there are many reasons for, uh, for the battery market changing. Of course, we have this increased demand for lithium, but by removing the cobalt and having more and more batteries go to an iron-based cathode, uh, you're essentially removing one of those barriers to battery production. So this lithium iron phosphate batteries are really starting to dominate the market um, and they don't involve the, the challenging and sometimes unethical mining practices of cobalt, which is typically mined in, in, in Africa um, and in particular in DRC. Um, so lithium mining is not that difficult. It's a salt. You can pump water into the ground and then evaporate out the water. 
um, and be left with the lithium, but that cobalt has been a barrier. So with, with LFP batteries um, <clears throat> kind of starting to dominate, we see prices coming down and, and then there's a huge competition. Um, and so the competition is also driving the prices down. Will the market stay that way? I don't know. You'll have to ask, you'll have to ask somebody who really re researches this. And, um, but and what we've seen is that they are coming down. Yeah, so and I would look at more than just the battery. Uh, I would look at the entire energy storage system as a whole and, and what value is being added to these products. It's more than just the, the battery. It's the inverter. It's the apps. Um, and, and what do you get? So when you look at the whole, um, the value is going up as well. It's a great point. And energy storage systems are just getting better and better and better. I can I can be, I was in Pittsburgh and I could look at my system and see how it's running from Pittsburgh using the, the Briggs and Stratton Energy Track app, right? Um, so more and more companies are, are producing products uh, that have closed loop communications, that have IoT functionality, um, even uh, load management uh, from you know, from a, from a distance at the, at the tip of your finger on your phone, right? And so there's a lot of value coming in uh, that's beyond just having a battery that stores energy. And those developments are happening pretty rapidly. I don't know where exactly the market will be in 10 years, but I suspect that lithium batteries will be cheaper. I suspect a lot of us will have migrated to electric vehicles uh, in particular out here in California. I can't count to more than about 10 cars when I'm on the freeway before I hit a uh, a, a Tesla. Um, and so I, I suspect that because we have so many happy Tesla owners out here in California, that as charging stations become more prevalent and home charging becomes more prevalent, and as the cost of fuel goes up, we'll see more and more of that. And that might drive the cost up by having more vehicles. Uh, but I'm, I'm not an expert in the market. Cylindrical cell construction, we're going to talk just a little bit. I like to point out what's happening inside a battery to people because I feel like if you can envision what happens inside a battery, you can understand that battery and it can help inform how you use and hopefully not abuse uh, your batteries and your battery cells. So what you're looking at there on the left is a cylindrical battery cell. And it, it consists of alternating rolled up layers of aluminum, copper, and then a separator layer. And that aluminum is typically coated. That's going to be the positive side of the battery. It's spray cast with a nano structured um, uh, metal oxide. In our case, that's uh, an, an iron phosphate actually um, that likes lithium, it absorbs lithium. And then the other side of the battery, the, the negative side of the battery um, is the graphite side. And so that, that copper side is spray cast with graphite and what you see in between, you can think of maybe a semi-porous uh, separator layer. You could think of maybe something like a piece of paper towel or something like wax paper that would separate the two. But it's porous to lithium ions. And so those lithium ions can move back and forth between the metal cathode and the graphite anode. And so if you look at your screen, I'm going to use my mouse and hopefully you can see it to illustrate what happens in a battery. So this region between the graphite anode and the the um, aluminum cathode with the LFP on the cathode side and the, the graphite on the anode side is all filled, it's backfilled. So it's originally under a vacuum and then they backfill it with this gel that contains salt. And that gel is kind of like uh, water with salt in it. It allows ions to move through it. So with a fully discharged battery, the majority of the lithium ions will be inside the metal oxide layer. We, of course, have lithium ions in the salt solution throughout, but the graphite will be devoid of most of the lithium. The lithium likes to be in the cathode side of the battery. So if I take a charger and I hook it up, like this charger is shown here, I can pump electrons off of the metal oxide layer away from the lithium. The lithium then goes from being a complete atom with its electron to an ion and drops into the electrolyte solution. So it's now part of that liquid, um, that gel. If I pump those electrons to the other side of the battery, to the copper foil side, the lithium will migrate across the porous sep separator layer and into the graphite, and that will represent a charged battery. So when the lithium is in the graphite side of the cell, it's a charged battery. When the cathode is devoid of that lithium, it wants it back. 
lithium wants to go there, but the only way it can get there is if it releases its electrons. So then we would have a charged battery. If I remove the charger and replace the charger with a load, a light bulb or something else, an LED or a car charger or whatever, I then provide a pathway for these electrons to go back to the metal oxide side of the cell and the lithium will be attracted across through that porous separator to the metal oxide where it prefers to be. That's a charge and discharge cycle of a cell, probably beyond the scope of this talk, but I'd like to give people a brief idea so they can visualize what's happening inside a cell. So uh, Teddy's asking, so where is the iron? Where is the where is the iron? The iron is here inside the cathode. So the, it's 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 really an uh, it's a iron phosphate um, oxide uh, film. You can think of little uh, nanoparticles, little particles, tiny particles that are spray cast onto the aluminum foil. So it's right here on that aluminum foil, and then the graphite is right here on that copper foil. And the whole thing is rolled up to give you a huge amount of surface area inside a single cell. One of the small 18650 cells, if you unroll it, would be almost two meters long uh, worth of this material. And we use larger cells in our batteries than, than the 18650s. So you've got a long um, strip of aluminum and copper foil that's inside there, all rolled up tightly around an iron core, encased in a steel shell. We use many, many of these cells inside our batteries to be able to deliver high currents. And then we get up to a higher 48 volt um, uh, voltage uh, by stacking 16 of these cells in series. So I want to point something out about cells that can happen. And I want to point out why people think of lithium batteries as dangerous. The electrolyte that I just mentioned in the previous slide, that electrolyte is an organic electrolyte. And that electrolyte, just like gasoline or diesel or wax, can burn. Um, if one of these cells gets short-circuited, suppose there's a car accident or you started out with a cheap uh, pouch cell and it got damaged, um, if the cell shorts out, that cell can start heating up and heating up that cell um, can, can eventually, if it gets to a high enough pressure, which is about 10 times atmospheric pressure, cause a vent on the cell to rupture. That vent is designed to prevent battery cells from, from exploding if they short circuit. So it releases and it releases the gas from that electrolyte and that gas can catch on fire. So let's suppose I have a cell where my mouse is on the screen that, that builds up a high pressure and off gases. Now that off gas can cause problems um, if it catches on fire because it can burn. And that burning of the off gassing cell can cause cells around the original ruptured cell to also heat up. If they heat up to the point they also off gas and that catches on fire, you can have a fire that's very difficult to put out. The point is the cobalt based batteries off gas and release the energy very quickly. And it's a, essentially a chain reaction in, one, in which one cell causes the next cell, causes the next cell, et cetera, et cetera, to, to react and off gas and burn. And that's a fire that's very difficult to put out because the fuel is there with the fire as well as the, those cobalt oxides, the oxygen is there inside the cell as well. Um, so those are difficult fires to put out. NMC batteries, um, LCO batteries, these batteries that contain cobalt are, are slightly higher voltages and burn much more quickly. With the case of our battery cells, we use LFP cells and they essentially put themselves out. You can see our fire tests in which UL actually forces a cell into thermal runaway, makes that cell off gas, um, but the battery does not propagate chain to chain, cell to cell um, in a chain reaction fashion, right? The, the battery puts itself out. We publish our results of our fire safety tests because we work very hard uh, to make some of the, the safest batteries on the market. And so if you wanna see those, look on our website, we show you how safe our batteries are. We don't have that unmitigated thermal runaway. I just want to show you an example. It's, it's, it's one thing to take my word for it. I'm you know, employed by Briggs & Stratton Energy Solutions, but it's another thing to just do some research on your own. This is a puncture test done by Will Prowse, who has a YouTube channel, Do It Yourself uh, Solar Power. Um, he took a drill and he drilled through what was labeled, which came from China, something that was labeled as a solid state battery. It definitely wasn't. It turned out to be an NMC battery. He drilled a hole through it and look how quickly it off gases and that 
that gas that's coming out of that cell um, rapidly bursts into, into uh, flames um, and releases the energy very quickly. On the right side, he had to drill multiple holes uh, through an LFP cell. Um, and by the time he drilled, I don't know, I see seven or eight holes there. I think he had to drill almost 10 holes to even get the thing to off gas. It did off gas, but very slowly and it did not result in a fire. If you wanna see that, um, I'll put the link. I don't see the link on there. You could search those on YouTube, but you can see those tests. Um, and a big difference between LN, LFP and NMC. This picture alone, this test that he did alone would convince me um, to not wanna use NMC in my house. Um, so I do encourage you to research this chemistry. If you haven't done so before, it's important to be slightly knowledgeable about the chemistry, um, just so you can make an informed decision and help your customers make informed decisions. How do we get a, a 48 volt battery? Well, the nominal voltage of these LFP battery cells, just it's, it's really just a difference of how much the lithium prefers to be in the cathode as, a per, as compared to the anode. And that measure of how much more the lithium likes to be in the cathode is, is the voltage. And these individual cells have a nominal voltage of 3.2 volts. That's the voltage at a 50% state of charge. So they charge all the way up to about 3.5 and discharge down to somewhere on 2.8, 2.7, a fully discharged battery. Well, how do we make a nine volt battery? We put six individual 1.5 volt lead acid cells, uh, sorry, um, uh, alkaline cells in series and we get nine volts, six times one and a half. How do we get a 48 volt simplify battery? We put 16 3.2 volt cells in series and notice 16 times 3.2, well, that's, that's bigger than 48, isn't it? So our batteries at a 50% at a state of charge, they do sit above 48. The word nominal means nameplate, right? And so when we say a nominal voltage of 48, that's because it's an increment of the old 12 volt um, lead acid batteries, right? And even the lead acid battery, as you know, from the gauge in your car, when it's charging, it'll go above 12 volts. And so batteries go through a range of voltages. That's important. It's also important to understand that there are 16 dif different packs of cells stacked in series inside the Simplify battery. And the reason that is important is we're gonna talk about how to keep those cells balanced, how to keep that battery operating well. And so what's inside every battery that you don't see is the very top of the battery. There's a fairly large computer in here that consists of communicating devices. It has a breaker. It has a contactor to open and close, turn on and off the battery. Um, and, and so we're going to talk about that battery management system, that computer that's inside those simplified batteries. Daniel, any questions I should answer before I keep moving? Well, we did have one. When I hear lipo battery lipo what is lipo what does the po mean in lipo polymer right so uh, it's a lithium ion battery with a a polymer um that's that's in that battery cell uh that that helps to it and actually i don't know for sure whether that polymer is is part of the separator layer um, so it's a good question and I have to research that a little bit more. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. So it's a great question. And Daniel, you don't happen to know the answer for that, do you? No, um, I, I believe it's part of the electrolyte, uh, but I'll, I'll look up that. Okay, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, when I was in graduate school, we did make supercapacitors and we made them out of polymers. And the, the polymer itself acts as an absorber um, for the ions. In the same way, when I was talking about the nanostructure of the cathode and anode, the, the graphite layer, um, instead of spray casting, you could have a polymer layer that's there. And that polymer, you can think of almost like cooked spaghetti, um, where there are spots inside that, that polymer for the charges to reside. And I suspect that, that the, um, but I don't know for sure, I suspect that the polymer is is you know a way to make the cathode of that battery but i'm sorry i don't know the answer for sure so let me jump in to battery management systems i'm going to show you i'm showing you a simple battery management on the right side of the screen um and the battery management system i want you to think of it as kind of the brain of the battery um 
Uh, it, it helps to make decisions about the operation of the battery and it helps to communicate to out, outside equipment about the battery in certain cases. A simple BMS, an analog BMS like the one on the right, is doing balancing of the cells. You can see that there are three different balancing wires coming out to make sure that all of the cells are at the same state of charge or at the same voltage. When cells are manufactured, they can have variations in their capacities that can be up to five, even more percent for lower quality cells. Now we, we buy premium battery cells and used in the construct, construction of our cells and we're typically around 2% variation in the capacities, but there are slight variation in cells. Now, once you start stacking many cells into a pack and making a large pack, that variation becomes even smaller, but still slightly different capacities means that if I start charging these cells by uh, connecting this to a positive source and this side to a negative source, if they're charged up in series like this, and if they didn't have balancing wires, then as soon as any one of the cells stops charging because it's full, the other cells would never get to that same state of charge. You would have variations in voltage between the first cell and the last cell in that series. So a battery management system helps to mitigate this by supplying little amounts of charge through these balancing wires, as you see there. So that's a simple BMS. Now, typically a very simple BMS, and I have one here. I took a picture, but I didn't put it in the slide. So this is a, a I don't know if you can see my picture, but this is a, a BMS that's on a laptop battery um, that I'm just holding up here just, just for fun. Um, this is a cheap BMS, right? It, it doesn't do a whole lot. It doesn't protect the battery that much, um, but it does prevent the battery from charging under uh, unfavorable conditions. It prevents it from overcharging, et cetera. Lead acid batteries, they don't have these computers inside them. Right. Lead acid batteries are a very different construction. They're consisting of uh, plates. In the case of, case of deep cycle batteries, these plates are fairly thick um, to maintain longer lifetimes. In the case of uh, car batteries, these are typically very thin to give you very high surface areas so you can have a lot of surface reaction at once. Um, but none of these lead acid batteries have BMSs in them and they make the battery much cheaper. Right, But if you've done systems with lead acid batteries, even deep cycle lead acid batteries, you know they don't last that long. Maybe a thousand cycles um, for a decent lived battery, 2000 has got to be close to max for a lead acid deep cycle battery. And you're very limited in how much you can discharge that battery. Most deep cycle batteries, we cycle them between 50% state of charge and 90. So you really have a small usable window um, in the case of a, a lithium iron phosphate battery, we're looking at 10,000 cycles, you know, five times to 10 times the lifetime of a, of a lead acid battery. And you're looking at much more usable capacity. You can, if you restrict your battery to 80%, you know, discharging it 80% of the way down to fully discharged, you're looking at 10,000 cycles. If you do 90% use of the capacity of that battery, you're still looking at five to 6,000 cycles, and even 100% discharge of the battery, you can do that 3,000 times. You can drain the battery to zero 3,000 times. So if you take 10,000 and you divide it by 365 days, if you cycled your battery once daily, you know, you can extrapolate that out to, to 27 years. Will your battery last 27 years? Well, it depends on how you drive it. Depends on how you, how you treat it, right? Um, depends on the conditions in which that battery is kept. If you have rain get on that battery, et cetera, you're probably not gonna last 27 years. But if you treat that battery well, we're talking about an investment that can power your home and it can store energy for a very long time. And even after 10,000 cycles, we're looking at approximately 80% of the original usable capacity of that battery. So does the, does the capacity of the battery decrease with time? Yes, a little bit, um, but, but even after, 10,000 cycles, we're looking at 80% of that capacity remaining. So these are really long lived batteries. And we do that by having a very good battery management system in there. So what do battery management systems look like? What do they do? Analog BMS systems don't have controls. You can't easily change them. They don't have communicating. They don't have a user interface. Um, you can't you know, load an app onto your phone and use them, but they can keep batteries safe. And these are cheaper options. Analog BMS systems 
um, can keep the battery safe as long as the charging system is properly programmed. So you have to do a little bit more to, to be careful with your batteries with an analog BMS. Here's a type of a programmable BMS. In fact, this is one that I've bought. This is a, a I think it was about $100 as an overkill solar. It's a 100 amp uh, 16 series 48 volt BMS um, for LFP. Um, and this one comes with a Bluetooth interface. It's not one that we use with our Simplify batteries. We've developed our um, BMS here in California and we use a very high-end BMS, much more sophisticated than this one that I'm showing. But I'm showing it to you because it shows you what you can do with it. Right. It shows you that you can uh, monitor out of this BMS. It shows you you can connect to it with Bluetooth. It shows you the balancing wires and it allows you to have some control. You can control, you can set on this BMS uh, the parameters, the extent to which you're going to discharge it. You can set, set the low voltage disconnect, et cetera. So what do our BMS systems look like? We have lower voltage options um, up to our 48 volt systems, which I said is the standard. Right, And these BMS units um, offer some pretty sophisticated equipment that monitors temperature, monitors state of charge, monitors health of the different uh, uh, battery packs inside uh, the, the module. And then we have high voltage options as well. Um, so we have a stack controller sitting up on the very top of these cells, as Daniel said, these are 4.3 kilowatt hour individual battery modules. These modules are all run, we only ever run the 48 volts in parallel, but these high voltage units, we run these modules in series. And that stack controller is acting as the BMS there um, to make sure that the, the individual uh, battery modules in the high voltage system operate uh, uh, seamlessly together to produce that high voltage and, and, and maintain balance, et cetera. So the stack controller is effectively the BMS in a high voltage option. The BMS inside the Amplify, the, the Phi, and our Simplify batteries, um, that is uh, internal and you, you really only see the communications ports on the top of it and the breaker. How can we balance cells? So how is that done? And Daniel, stop me if, if there's a, a question that, that I need to address. Um, but we can balance cells in different ways. And I want you to follow my mouse and I'm gonna point out a, a somewhat inefficient way of balancing cells, which is probably what this laptop battery that I've got here in my hand does. So this, let's suppose that I hooked up a charger to this system and I start charging these battery cells um, by running a current down in this direction through the cells. If cell number two gets completely charged, the current no longer can pass straight through cell number two. There are no ions left to move from the, the LFP side to the cathodes or to the anode side, the graphite side. And so the cell would stop the current from flowing through cell number one. But if I allow the the charge to flow around cell number two, flowing through this resistor and then throwing, flowing through this, this diode and then around cell number two in this fashion, I can still charge cell number three up. The downside to this is it has to be a fairly high resistor. So we're only kind of trickle charging around cell number two. And because there's a resistor there, what happens when we flow current through a resistor? It generates what? Heat. Right? Resistance. So in this, yeah, resistance and resistance and heat. And so in this, in this manner, we dissipate power, right? So you can dissipate a small amount of power in the form of heat, but that makes this, this charging system less efficient. How else could we do this? Imagine charging two cells in this fashion. Imagine having a charger hooked up on the top here and the bottom here and flowing a current down through cell number one towards cell number two. Well, if cell number two is at a slightly higher voltage than cell number one, I can be flipping these switches from the closed position at the top to closed positions at the bottom simultaneously. And by fluttering these switches back and forth, when they're at the top position, the top side of the capacitor is connected to the top side of cell number one, and the bottom side of the capacitor is connected to the bottom side of cell number one. So when the switches are in the up position, the voltage of the capacitor gets charged up to match the voltage of the cell. 
when the switch is flipped to the down position, the voltage of the capacitor then gets discharged across cell number two and matches cell number two and vice versa. So if cell number two was at a higher voltage, then it would charge the capacitor and charge cell number one, all without much resistance. A very efficient way of charging um, the cells by using cell balancing um, through, through active uh, charge shuttling. Um, and so this is a much better way to, and this is just for illustration purposes, but this is a much better way to um, kind of uh, keep the cells balanced. It's much more efficient. And, and we use this to round trip efficiency in our batteries can, can be very high, even with an inverters inefficiencies. You know, we're really looking about generating one to 2%. It depends highly on temperature, but one to 2% of the energy used to charge a battery generates heat. And as you know, when you charge something up, it often gets warm. It depends on how quickly you charge it, what temperature it was to begin with. Um, that influences the viscosity of the electrolyte, but round trip efficiencies can be very high for lithium batteries. 98% under optimal conditions, round trip efficiency. With an ESS system, when you couple the inefficiencies of the charging equipment, you're still looking at a 92, 94% um, round trip efficiency from a battery, um, which is pretty high, right? You're, you're losing less than 10% of the energy um, in the storage, in the full cycle of the storage process. What if you don't have a communicating battery? What if you don't have our more advanced BMS? You opt in for the, the, the same high quality cells and build, um, but you don't have that more advanced communicating um, BMS. You still have a BMS that offers that high efficiency with the charge shuttling, but it doesn't offer communications and you might need to protect it against, against cold weather. Well, there are many options for programming and monitoring your batteries. We're showing the BMB Smart 712. The Smart there just it indicates that it can communicate with uh, Bluetooth from Victron. This is a good system. I have been very impressed with the Victron uh, uh, app and the Bluetooth connectivity to my device. You're limited on range. It only will communicate with your phone when you're around 25 feet away from it. But you have smart charge controllers that you can use your phone to program. You have uh, battery monitoring equipment. We're showing you the, the SCP there um, as well from Schneider. Um, so if you have a, a battery without advanced communications, you can still deal with um, simpler battery BMS systems and monitor those batteries closely. There are many people that choose to use our Phi battery because you have savings on cost. You're not paying for that, all that complexity of the BMS. Um, and it might be a better fit for an old lead acid replacement. For communicating batteries, we have closed loop communications. And I'm gonna point out a couple of things. So one, a CAN bus, the, the, the bus there, we're connecting uh, one battery to the next, to the next, to the next through these battery ports. And if you install one of our batteries with closed loop communications, you have to be extra careful that at the very last battery in the series, we need to notify the CAN bus equipment, right, that we are terminating the, the, um, the system there. And so this, uh, there's a little terminating resistor. I think it's just a 100 ohm resistor that goes between a couple of the communicating pins in the CAN bus network. And so you terminate the first and the last battery in that, in that stack of parallel batteries. And we're running, we're daisy chaining from battery to battery, battery to battery. Um, and we've got to terminate. You don't want to ever have any open uh, CAN bus ports. The system won't know, um, know where the end of the chain is. These batteries are communicating with each other. And so I'm showing you that terminating resistor there in the picture. It does come in a plastic bag inside every Amplify and every Simplify battery. Um, and so you wanna make sure you have that, okay? There's a third port on each of the batteries as well. And this is to, to we only need to take the communications port out of one battery, that's a device port, and send it into the inverter. So any one of the batteries uh, in the, in the um, parallel stack um, can send the information out to the charging equipment. In this case, um, the last, the farthest right on the on the series is running to the inverter, and we don't have one shown in the in the picture I'm showing you. Okay, I wanted to point that out. Here you can see it again. This yellow wire here. So this is a a battery um, stack um, that we have. There's six batteries all in parallel there. 
couple of points to make. We're taking power off of opposite ends of the bus bar. And by doing that, we're making the system as symmetric as possible. Um, so we're pulling wire off this end of the bus bar and the other end of the bus bar. And that eliminates some imbalances in the system due, due to the, um, the, a little bit of resistivity of the bus bars themselves. Um, but also that I'm showing you the wiring here of the uh, communications port. And again, this yellow wire here from the stack of six batteries, you would only need one of those to go communicate with your inverter, whether it's a Solark or one of our inverters, et cetera. Here is a uh, high voltage product from us. Our high voltage stacks range between 200 and almost 1200 volts, 1180 volts DC. Um, these are suitable for large scale projects. Um, I don't know of, I guess Solark has just come out with a 30 kW and a 60 kW systems. Um, Daniel, do you know the voltage range on Solark's larger inverters? I do know that we have, and I think maybe when the customer asked earlier when our high voltage options are going to come out, maybe he was referring specifically to our Solark um, specific battery solutions. Yeah, and I believe so. It's 150 volts DC, and, and I'm reading a little more into it. I believe the 60K is a 480, uh, and then the 30K is a 208. Um, and it's 150 volts DC um, to, to make that. Uh, why, why I'm talking just, you know, I think I maybe misunderstood uh, LiPo or uh, it was polymer, a Nathan, another Nathan had, uh, you know, the polymer is the electrolyte instead of a liquid or a gel is what he chimed in on. Uh, but you. Li, uh, you know, lithium Li, Fe, which is ferrous, but what's the PO is the phosphate. Oh, oh, the question. Okay, uh, lithium iron phosphate, LFP, he was asking about. Okay. Yeah. And the last question here, I know we're, we're kind of running out of time here a little bit, um, but um, we showed some lead acid. Everybody knows you can recycle a lead acid battery. How do you recycle our simplified battery? How do you recycle any lithium ion battery? So that's a good question, Daniel. And I don't know all the details that go into that. And I will look that up. That's something I do need to know. There, there, there are challenges, of course, to recycling batteries. There's a, a, um, a company out here that, uh, that recycles these batteries and many different recycling programs exist. Um, I, I know that you can return these batteries to locations that sell them. So Companies like uh, Best Buy or Home Depot will take batteries back, but how do they get recycled and how, what does that process look like? I don't know for sure. I will look that up. I will tell you that recycling a battery that doesn't have the, the kind of toxic uh, cobalt element in it and just has iron and phosphate in it instead is much simpler. I mean, phosphate exists in our DNA and the and, and um, iron, of course, exists in our bodies. Um, so it's, it's an easier recycling process with LFP, but I don't know the details of how that happens, whether they crush the cells, try to extract the electrolyte and purify the lithium from the electrolyte. Um, I'm not sure about, about that. Um, I'll look into that. Daniel, I always forget on the name of that company that was started by the former uh, Tesla employee. Um, and I ask you every time it's in Nevada, um, it's a big recycling company that's focusing on recycling battery cells for cars. I'll look it up again. Oh, shoot. We've forgotten again. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, I would like to give you your the, their name because you might go to their website. Oh, Redwood and, Materials. That Redwood, other, thank the you. The other Nathan chimed in again. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, this guy should be running the, the, the talk. Too bad I can't unmute him. Thank you, Nathan. All right. So uh, let's talk just a little bit about battery specifications, just so you know them. Um, Battery energy capacity is, is given in uh, kilowatt hours, and that's, that's how much it can hold, right? So when I told you to think of a battery as, as like a water tank that holds energy, um, that, you know, the size of the water tank, the size of the battery, that's what we refer to in energy capacity. Um, and most new batteries are, are, are um, specifying the size of the battery, if it's a large battery, in kilowatt hours. You might get it in, in uh, watt hours if it's a small battery, like a laptop uh, battery. 
um, or even milliamp hours. And I have to explain why that's the case. So it used to be that most batteries that we would use were just all 12 volt batteries. And so you could just specify how much, how many amp hours there was. And so by specifying the total amount of amps, which is a charge per time times time, you by specifying the total amount of charge that could move, if you knew the voltage, you would know how much energy was in that battery. Now that we have various voltages of batteries out there, it makes a lot more sense to just specify how much energy the battery can hold and deliver in kilowatt hours. That's an energy measure, not, an, not a charge measure. Um, and I do want to point out that the amount of energy that a battery can deliver depends on the conditions. So at slightly warmer temperatures, 30 to 40 uh, degrees operational temperature of the cells of the battery, you get the most performance. And um, once you get about be above 25 Celsius, there's not much difference. But at lower temperatures, the electrolyte is more viscous. Um, the other thing to point out here is that uh, the output of a battery, the total capacity of the battery depends on how quickly you discharge it. Right? So if you try to discharge very quickly, you don't get quite as much energy out of the battery. You generate a bit more heat. Um, that Ohm's law, the I squared R, it depends on the square of the current. The other thing to mention is what is the standard? So the standard for lithium batteries is a C over uh, five discharge rate for the capacity. So if you discharge the battery fully over a five hour period, how many kilowatt hours do you get out of it? The old standard for lead acid deep cycle batteries, I believe was a C over 20. So discharging them over 20 hours. So lithium batteries are a lot more efficient um, and you get deeper depths of discharge. Nominal voltage. So again, nominal means named voltage, right? Um, but most companies are using the word nominal to specify the voltage of the battery at a 50% state of charge. That's when half the current is in the cathode half, or half the charge is in the cathode, half in the anode. Uh, so for LFP, for ours, 16 LFP cells, 16 times 3.2, I guess that's 51.2, right? And then the C rate, this other word that you should know if you're getting into batteries, C rate is the charge and discharge rate. Um, and so typically we specify a C rate of C over two for all of our batteries. C over two means that the maximum rate that battery could be charged or discharged continuously. And for us, that's a two hour period. So the capacity of the battery in two hours um, would be a C over two discharge rate. If I discharge the, the, the full capacity of the battery by 100% over four hours, I'd be discharging at a C over four rate, et cetera. You know, Nathan, somebody had, had kind of chimed in here um, and they said, I believe that water stored, like energy stored, is better viewed in terms of the potential energy. Yes. Flow, yes. flow has power of being in motion, but the rate is the electrical equivalent is current. Yes, I would agree, right? So there's a gravitational potential energy in a water tank, right? And it's, it's very small compared to a battery tank, right? It does, it, a single one of our batteries could probably fill up that entire tank to a height of 50, you know, from a height of 50 feet below. Um, but there's a gravitational potential energy in, in the storage of water at elevated heights, and there's an electrical potential energy, really a chemical potential energy inside the battery cells. The analogy I do with water here is uh, voltage is kind of equivalent to the pressure in the lines, and just like you couldn't uh, fill the entire water tank there in two minutes, you would just have to put too much pressure, the lines would burst, your pump would probably be running at way too high of a pressure, you can't fill the, a, a battery um, in two minutes either, right? Um, you need time to get that charge into and out of the battery. And so the wiring of a battery, the connections, the internal electrical connections inside a battery, the BMS, the car current flows through the BMS as well. All of those things are limited. And if you, 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 know, if you put 80 volts across a 48 volt battery, it would start charging very quickly, but you would damage the battery in the same way as if you put 200 PSI through those, um, through those lines there on, on the water storage tank. So you can think of the pressure in the lines like a voltage. You can think of the, there is a maximum rate at which you can push water through pipes due to pressure. 
there's a maximum rate in which you could push energy into batteries. And so that's why I'm showing you this. And I really appreciate uh, those, these comments. So I'm going to just talk to you a little bit. We're almost done here. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit and I wanna save time for questions. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about our product offerings. The, our high voltage solutions can run anywhere from a single battery cabinet, like the one on the left, operating with a Solark 30K, all the way up to a huge um, shipping container filled uh, with these modules. And these shipping containers uh, come designed and outfitted with HVAC systems to keep the batteries at the optimal temperatures. Um, it's really a complete package that our team can design to fit your high voltage, uh, large scale project needs. Um, what's shown there, uh, Daniel, what's the name of our uh, mobile solution there in a small uh, mobile cabinet? I, I'm blanking on the name. So the, there's the Access, which is the stationary one with the solar arc you see there, and the Express, which is the Express, one with the, mag, the Magna sign that you see there just to the left as well. Right. And so these, you know, the, the um, Express cabinet that's there, that can offer a nice solution uh, for maybe you're in a construction phase and you're doing the electrical wiring in a house, you can't use the electricity in the house. Um, you might want a mobile option like this that doesn't provide the, the noise to the environment that a generator does. Um, and so we will get contractors that'll use this type of express cabinet, or maybe you just want to have that in the office. Um, you want to have a mobile uh, pack that you could take to a remote job site. Um, this is a great uh, little mobile solution that we have um, that we've been manufacturing for some time. This is the, the Solark, as Daniel mentioned, the access cabinet is a, a very common solution for us. We sell a lot of these with Solark 12Ks, 8Ks in them. Um, and what you're getting there is about 23 kilowatt hours of battery storage with three of the, or with six of these um, 3.84 kilowatt hour batteries. Um, we also, our batteries, both the Phi and the Amplify batteries um, uh, fit in this wall mountable rack. Um, I've made kind of a custom mat rack for my three batteries so I can use a bus bar. Um, they also fit in, we can use this ca same cabinet with uh, more shelving um, to produce uh, a cabinet that'll hold up to 12 of these batteries. And keep in mind, this battery cabinet is waterproof. It's outdoor rated um, with that temperature controlling fan in there. Both the Amplify battery in the top right and the Simplify battery in the bottom right have that ad advanced BMS that we've developed here in California. Um, and it offers us some pretty cool uh, capabilities. The small format batteries that we have, people often like these for mobile solutions. The 3.8 kilowatt Phi battery, it doesn't offer that communications uh, enabled BMS, but it does offer the same great battery pack. And this comes in a 24 volt option. Uh, no closed loop communications with this one, but we do have closed loop communications with this Amplify battery. Um, our limitation is really uh, 60 batteries, not 72 that's there. And that has to do with the software we use to con uh, control it. If you really go beyond about 24 batteries though, it starts to make sense to look into higher voltage options. Maybe beyond 36, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend this battery, even though it's a fairly economical um, closed loop communication battery. Once you get large enough in your storage, it makes sense uh, just start going over to the high voltage systems, which you get a little bit more bang for your buck with. This is an outdoor rated, our Simplify 4.98 kilowatt hour battery. Um, offers a little bit more capacity, five kilowatt hours of capacity instead of the 3.8. It's also really nicely wall mounted. So it comes with a wall bracket and you hang the battery on that wall bracket, like hanging a picture. Um, it's a heavy battery, it weighs 180 pounds. Uh, we could do up to 60 of these as well. This battery can surge for 10 minutes to provide, um, it should say 5.1 kilowatt hours. These normally are running at um, uh, 50 volts or above. And so 100 amps times 50 volts is five uh, kilowatts. Um, so these are some of the, our battery cabinets I'm showing you here, but I'm gonna get into some of the stuff that, that our batteries can do in the, in, the, in the few minutes that we have remaining. Uh, I'm gonna take you through a charging cycle. When we first start to charge up our battery, think of that uh, pressure in the tank analogy I was giving you. Um, when I first start to charge up a fully discharged battery, I'm gonna run it through a constant current part of the cycle. We call that the bulk part of the cycle. So for the five battery that's shown here in the bottom left-hand corner, as I push that charge into the battery, I have to apply a voltage higher than the battery's voltage. So that battery voltage will start out at 48 volts. I'm gonna apply a slightly higher voltage. 
So sometimes when you look at your battery bank, it might be at a voltage of 55 volts. That doesn't mean the battery's voltage is 55 volts. It means the charge controller's voltage is 55 volts. I have to be above the battery's voltage to push charge in. So I start pushing charge into my battery. I do that at a constant current. That constant current for the Phi battery and the Amplify battery is 37.5 amps per battery. So if I had two batteries, I'd run that at a constant current of 75 amps. I, can, I, I don't wanna go higher than that. I can go lower than that if I like. Maybe my charge controller can't do 75 amps, only 60, no problem. But you're running a constant current process. As that current, as that battery starts to fill up, I start having to push harder and harder to get the charge into the battery, to get the charge to move, right? And so the voltage starts to rise throughout this constant current process. We terminate the bulk cycle and start an absorb cycle once we hit 56 volts. So as that voltage is rising up, the current just stays constant. Once the voltage rises to 56 volts, we just hold it there for six minutes, 0.1 hours, and the current starts to drop off, okay? If you can't specify on your charge controller how much time to hold for the absorb cycle, um, then what you can do is use an end amp and you can set that to 2% of your battery bank capacity. So suppose you had two, uh, um, two of these batteries uh, with 150 uh, amp hour capacity, um, then what, what you could do is specify that 2% of that 150. And so you, once you hit three amps, you could terminate the cycle when your current comes down to three. We don't always recommend it. It's not needed to float the batteries, but if you've got some free source of renewable energy, you might wanna float the batteries. You do that at 54 volts with our batteries. These are the charging specs of our batteries. Like I said, 37.5 on the Amplify and Simplify 48 volt options, 75 amps per battery on the 24 volt option. It's got a, a lower voltage, but higher uh, amp hour capacity. And then on the 4.98 kilowatt hour, 48 volt battery, it's a slightly higher capacity. So we're charging a little faster. These are all C over two ratings for our batteries. Discharge, we can surge the uh, the 5, 48, and 24 volt battery at 80 amps for 10 minutes, and the Amplify and Simplify battery can surge at 100 amps each, right? That's 100 amps um, times 50 volts or five kilowatts out of each of those batteries for up to 10 minutes. Um, so these batteries are capable of surging without damage to the battery. Um, when you're charging a battery, that charging process, its current is flowing into the battery, Due to the internal resistance of the battery, um, the voltage of the system will appear higher than the battery's resting voltage. And if you are sending the current out of the battery and discharging the battery, the voltage of your battery system will appear like it's under the resting voltage of the battery. So typically a fully charged battery, what's one of our fully charged batteries voltages, Daniel? Resting voltage? Around 53. Around 53, 53 and a half. It depends a little bit on temperature. I think mine will sit around 53.2 fully charged. What's a fully discharged battery for us, Daniel? Hopefully no lower than 48. Yep, no lower than 48, right? So full, 48 volts would be a fully discharged battery. If you try to get more energy out of your battery, um, you could potentially damage it. And really there's not much energy above 53 volts on these batteries and not much energy below 48 volts. Right, something like 98% of the energy is within those values. So you don't need to push those batteries that hard. And many of our customers will try to um, try to keep that voltage from really going be below somewhere like 50, 51 volts. Now this is a resting battery, so it's zero current. So we discharge a little bit and then we stop, we let the battery rest, we make a mark for what the voltage is. So you can see this is starting up at 53.2. And as it discharges to 50% when it's resting, it'll say 52.4 volts, right? And so um, that we give you this curve, but it looks a little different if we are in a discharge cycle. When we're in a discharge cycle, we will observe a lower voltage than the resting voltage as the battery is discharging because you lose some of that voltage across the internal resistance of the battery. So here I'm showing you that if you're discharging at a C over five rate, a current which would result in a drained battery in five hours, you'll see a higher voltage than if you're discharging at a rapid rate, C over two discharge rate, which would discharge your battery in two hours. So this voltage difference between the top and the bottom there, that has to do with an internal resistance drop. And this is why it makes it hard 
you know the exact voltage that the battery would be at um, if it's discharging, um, uh, uh, if it's not discharging, if it's in a state of rest. Here's something different. I'm showing you what a, a single LFP cell looks like as it discharges at different temperatures. I'm discharging at a C over two rate. And if I'm discharging at a C over two rate at really cold temperatures, right? The battery has a lot more internal resistance due to the viscosity of the electrolyte. But the good news is, is that you can see the voltage, you've got a much bigger voltage drop compared to resting. So resting is at the top here. Um, you have a much bigger difference due to the internal resistance at low temperatures. And in fact, you hit 2.4 volts on this particular cell when you still have 60% of the energy left in the battery. Um, but the good news is, is you won't sit at zero if you're discharging a battery at C over two, the temperature of that cell will quickly jump up to higher temperatures. The way I was able to keep this, the temperature of this cell down is I had this cell in a cold oil bath um, to keep it at specific temperatures so it could see what it would look like. So typically as that battery starts to charge and discharge, and we're almost done here, um, the temperature will go up and you'll get that most of the energy out of that battery. Right. If you're in a really cold environment, you might be able to keep that battery's temperature only at 20 degrees Celsius through a discharge cycle. Remember, that's internal battery temperature, not external temperature. So we can we can use this. I'm going to skip a couple of these, um, but we can use this to offer solutions in cold environments. So for very cold environments, the best solution we've got is um, keep your batteries inside a cabinet. Um, sit them on a, a foam pad and have buy one of our um, heating pads. So we have these heating pads that can be wired into our batteries. They monitor the internal temperature of the battery, use a little bit of power, 75 watts when they're on, to run the heating pad and keep the battery at optimal temperature. So that prevents the battery from getting below zero degrees and allows us to charge. You can line the walls of that container if you're in a really cold environment uh, with, with insulating materials. Um, you can even just have the batteries sitting on a uh, foam reflective pad. By utilizing the, the advanced BMS inside the Amplify and Simplify battery, we can actually charge these batteries right at lower temperatures. We're one of the few companies that will charge our batteries below zero degrees Celsius. So we can charge all the way down to negative 20 degrees Celsius. It's just the charging cycle gets slow. I'm gonna talk just briefly about that. By charging at a, a slow rate at really cold temperatures, one amp and then up to three amps and then up to 20 amps, by, by ramping up the speed at which we're charging in cold weather, as we start charging, the battery starts to warm up. And as the temperature rises, we start increasing the rate of that, that charging cycle until we get to a full rate of charging at seven Celsius. And we can maintain that all the way up to 50 Celsius. The battery is communicating all this information through the device port to the inverter. So if you have an appropriate communicating inverter, the battery itself will control the inverter's uh, charging rate. And so in this way, with this kind of unique solution here, we can offer a battery that can perform in low temperatures and even high temperature environments safely. This battery can still discharge at 15 amps, all the way up to 70 Celsius. 50 Celsius is a hot tub too hot to sit in. That gives you an idea this battery can work in higher temperatures well, as well, it just reduces its rate to protect the battery. So we have, all, we have low temperature and high temperature solutions for you too. If you want to learn more about this, we have high temperature, uh, or sorry, we have uh, harsh environments trainings coming up, um, and we'll get into that with time. I think at this point, we should probably pause and ask for questions. Um, we're, we're out of time. I'm sorry for that, um, but I'm going to just jump to the last slide here and say, um, if you need NABSAP credits, please email me your name as it's registered with NABSAP and you'd like it to appear on your certificate email us training at simplifiedpower.com. Um, and uh, if you are not already an elite installer, part of our elite IQ program, our installer qualification program, consider joining us. Um, we've got several hundred installers throughout the world and we are growing. 
um, and there are various bonuses um, that you can get for that. Unfortunately, this bonus that I'm showing on the left has expired, um, but we might be able to convince our bosses to, uh, to offer some others in the near future. So Daniel, any great questions that we should be answering? Well, there's been a lot of great questions. Thank you all for who put questions in. Um, one of the ones is a couple of people asked, uh, do we offer flow batteries? Do we offer lithium titanate batteries? And when I walk around some of these shows, I see maybe one flow company here. What, how do you see the, the future of some of these flow batteries or lithium titanate batteries? That's a, that's a good question. And um, I don't know yet. Uh, you have the ability to charge these lithium titanate batteries. And by the way, for those who don't know, this is a different uh, type of anode. So instead of using the graphite, um, you have the ability to charge very quickly, but we're also looking at a much more expensive manufacturing process. Um, and so I, I, I expect that the true revolution is really going to occur with uh, the solid state battery manufacturing. And, and they're anticipating that that's really going to um, break into full production somewhere around 2028 or so. Um, I'm not We've Daniel and I spent some time talking uh, with people that are using lithium titanate, and I'm still convinced it's just far too expensive to be a good viable product for um, for mainstream applications. But for applications in which you need very rapid charge and discharge, very rapid charge, um, uh, the lithium titanate solves some of the problems. It also uh, uh, doesn't have the problems of graphite um, with the intercalation process. So the ions can get into the lithium titanate much better, which means you can charge those titanate batteries in cold temperatures rapidly. Um, and so it gets around some of the problems that I was just discussing that we have a solution for, but many, many manufacturers don't. And um, I guess I'm just still convinced it, it's too expensive uh, for mainstream market so far. Any other questions, Daniel? Yeah, of course. Uh, um, uh, the other Nathan had, had kind of put the, the web address for wed, redwoodmaterials.com and just poking around there briefly, you know, one of the things, the opportunity here is to repurpose some of these batteries uh, and not just dispose yeah. of them. Uh, so I don't uh, if so, you want so to speak a little bit to that. That's a great point, Daniel. And I have to say that I, I am keeping this uh, laptop battery that's here on my table. Um, because I've harvested uh, cells. So typically when you have a laptop battery die or one of these batteries die, you'll have you know, 80% of the cells or 60% of the cells, as long as they're not rusty, will be good. And so I've had uh, students at my university uh, build um, batteries uh, out of recycled cells and you can buy old laptop batteries, uh, take apart the cells and build one of your own. And that's why I had that BMS that I showed you earlier in the talk. So. Good point. And so Redwood Materials does that. Is that what you're saying, Daniel? It, it looks like it's part of their solution, not not the whole solution, but a really exciting stuff, redwoodmaterials.com. Uh, so Ken's asking, if I have a five kilowatt, uh, if I have a five kilowatt hour battery and a five kilowatt solar system, I should charge the battery in about an hour. But you had mentioned that is not good for the battery. So should I reduce my panel size to 2.5 kilowatts? Uh, no. I already kind of know the answer. I want to yes. answer it, Nathan. Um, I would say no, but what you could do is program the inverter to slow that charge rate by keeping the larger solar array. You're going to allow winter uh, when the sun's lower in the sky um, or a cloudy day to still harvest some of that energy. Did you want to add to that, Nathan? Oh, I just want to say that, uh, so first off, a you know five kilowatt array, just like mine, even you know in summer when the sun is most directly overhead, is probably going to put out like four kilowatts of, of power. And remember that power can go to different places. So you can send some of that power to your loads and you can send the remaining uh, 2.5 kilowatts into your battery at a rate of 2.5 kilowatts of charging so that your batteries would take, I think you said you had five kilowatt hours worth of batteries so you could charge, charge them in two hours safely. So as Daniel said, program your charge controlling equipment, never get rid of your solar, um, just keep adding to it. <laughs> um, I think, I, I, I think there's uh, plenty of things you could do with that extra energy. And if you don't use it, your charge controller will just um, clip it. You know, you're, you just make sure that you set the charging rate um, of your system uh, to an amperage, which results in, um, you know, a, a C over two charging rate if you only have five kilowatt hours. If that's our battery, 
keep in mind that our charging rate is typically a little higher than industry average. Uh, most other companies are looking at stuff more like C over three for their home batteries. So you wanna make sure to specify um, the right conditions for your battery. Two more questions um, and then we'll be finish up here. Um, well, uh, what is the opposite of voltage sag? I'm familiar with voltage sag when, when discharging, but what is the artificial voltage boost called when charging? That's uh, from oh, David. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I would have to make something up and co call it voltage elevation. Um, but, but basically we're, we, he, what, what this question is talking about is that uh, charge controller voltage having your battery bank voltage above uh, the battery's resting voltage because you have to be up there to, you have to be at a higher voltage to, to push that charge into the batteries. So I don't know, voltage sag is, is the phenomenon on the discharge side. I don't know on the charge side, Daniel, you don't know either? No. I don't know if there is a name for it, to be honest. Um, Last uh, but, question. Yep. Um, well, we keep coming in, keep them coming everybody. We'll be here as long as you have questions. Uh, more, let's back up a little bit. What is the advanced BMS versus the standard BMS? If you could explain those terms. So our advanced BMS has programming that allows us to control and communicate equipment out. Uh, we also have the opportunity to, to allow you to use our more advanced BMS with a closed loop communications to monitor on the individual battery uh, uh, module level uh, with these new Sun Road gateways, they have a program designed around simplify batteries that can monitor our individual batteries, tell you tons of information about each of the batteries, internal temperature, et cetera. Um, so the, the advanced BMS allows us to use computer programs to control the behavior of the charging and discharging cycle of the simplify 4.98 kilowatt hour battery and the amplify 3.84 kilowatt hour batteries. So that advanced BMS offers the closed loop communications, which allows us to write programs so that the battery itself uh, can control the charging equipment. It's also a more plug and play battery because you don't have to do the programming. You can simply set your equipment, um, your solar or your Briggs and Stratton inverter to CAN bus and the battery dictates how it wants to be treated. So hopefully that answers your question. Our Phi battery does not have that, that um, communications capability. Only our Amplify and our Simplify batteries do. Yeah, great. Thank you, Nathan. Um, can you discuss uh, the limit of charging rates that are, and I, I hope I'm getting this right, that are too slow? What happens if we're only charging at C over 10 or C over 20? Can that be bad for a battery? No, battery. I don't think that charging slowly causes problems for the battery. Keeping the battery at elevated voltages for a very long period of time um, would damage the battery, but you're not going to be charging slowly at an elevated voltage. So we wouldn't want to keep the battery at above 56 volts for a long period of time. In fact, we, we recommend once it hits 56 volts to just keep it there for six minutes. Um, but slowly charging the battery is, is, is not going to cause problems with the battery. Uh, so it's, it's charging too rapidly that matters. Thank you. Uh, is the max number of batteries limited by CAN bus or something else? Uh, CAN bus, the software within uh, CAN bus for our batteries is actually limits them at 60 and not uh, 72. And that's the, that's the CAN bus limitation. I, I think that's it. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm sorry I, I ran out of time here, but we did really get through the bulk of the material. I'll be sending you these slides. If you want your NABSAP certificate, you may have already left, but just send an email to training at simplifypower.com. If you have additional questions, or if you want us to hook you up with an application engineer in our sales department, they can help design your system, help answer questions you might have on whether your system is is appropriate for one of our solutions. So I Daniel, guess we do really have one. Yes, we do ahead. have one one last one. Uh, Kenny's asking, what if you never get up to fifty six? What if you never get up to fifty six volts? Um, well, I guess if you're charging slowly, you won't you wouldn't necessarily get up to fifty six volts if you hit the end amp, right? So if you're if you're charging very slowly. 
um, your battery would never hit 56. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the battery. It just means if I put that charge in very slowly, um, I, I'm not gonna hit that end voltage. You still should be at 100% state of charge when your cycle ends, right? Because you would hit the end amps um, and never hit 56, but you still should see 53.2, 53.1 volts as the maximum voltage of a 48 volt bank. Yep. If you're interested in a, in a 24 volt bank, cut that number in half. Yep, thank you so much. That was all the questions, Nathan. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your attendance. I hope you learned something. I always learn something from the answers here. Um, and I've got some uh, learning to do myself. So I'll go back and do some research on the recycling. And uh, I need to look up the lithium polymers so that I'm uh, more experienced about that. Although I know the, the, the question was actually, what does the P stand for? And that's LFP, lithium iron phosphate. So thank you, everybody. Take care.